For the sake of honesty, it is worth mentioning, and many people already know this, that at first Woden, Odin, was not the project supervisor in charge of creating the Nine Worlds, or rather, he was not the one in charge of creating a system that would regulate the consciousnesses of humans and other beings, and that would interconnect them in the various worlds together. The god in charge of this was initially Tyr, who we are already familiar with through the rune Tewas at the least. He was the supervisor, and all other gods who also participated in the project each had their own task. But their task was somewhat changed, as came the time for the Norse god's design system to connect and to integrate with the processes that were developed by other teams, other pantheons. Alongside them, the Slavic, Greek, and Egyptian gods were working too, as well as many other teams, systems, and families. Every one of them worked on their own task, and it was crucial that the progress of each team was synchronous with the progress of all others. Nobody should be getting ahead or lagging behind. All of these processes that took place at some point in the ancient world were conducted in order to make our present reality, if not perfect, but functional enough to ensure that gods, humans, worlds, and other races are all included in a process of mutual coexistence. In which every human, every race, and every God's goal would not be diminished in its accomplishment. At the same time, a fair competition amongst the algorithms of victory will allow the best and most impeccable ones to win. We are now unable to see this in its entirety, how the combining of different systems took place. However, we can dissect one project, one set of programs, which, as previously stated, has reached us in the present day, if not in its entirety, but then definitely undistorted. And this is the reason why information that we will be using when we analyze the deeds of gods and heroes of the Norse pantheon will allow us to do so with a greater degree of truthfulness, a greater degree of probability. And we will not make errors relying on someone else's lies and mistakes because there are none there. I mean the mistakes present in the previous links of the chain that carried this information to us today. When Tyr and his team began to integrate the already manifested and prepared system into the general operating system, according to the general guidelines, he had to correct many algorithms of that system. Because they could, for example, only function in an autonomic, isolated mode, while they could not function the way they were intended if interwoven into the general operating system. Algorithms of good would turn quickly into the algorithms of evil, should they not be strengthened and fortified. But every team has its own goal, the original technical task that contains the primary and the secondary objectives. 
The most important thing is the goal, basically the nucleus of the program. What is it for? The program that was being developed by the Norse gods insisted on creating such a type of civilization, such a type of order, which would make honesty, honor, and decency the central qualities of the victor. The victor must be impeccable. It was Tyr's idea, which, after failing in the Norse pantheon, in the Norse current, he continued to realize on Celtic land under the name Nuada. So, how did it happen that Tyr had to concede his supremacy to Odin, who was at the time the god of knowledge, the god of magic? It happened in the following way. When the systems started to work in conjunction with other systems, planned injections were to be introduced into the world of Norse gods. Injections are such instruments that make life difficult for the system and test its resilience. Such injections are introduced in any project. This is basically how programming works. First, a tree of current reality is constructed. We see it from start to finish, and we know what we want to get. We have to get from point A to point B. There is a certain route. This is what is called a tree of current reality, what we need to obtain. Next, the program, the tree of current reality, starts to undergo injections of a certain kind. This is done to see if the tree is resistant to these injections or not. We check and we identify vulnerabilities and develop additional programs that either help to eliminate these vulnerabilities or build greater resistance to them. Or, even better, turn those vulnerabilities into strengths. Then, we test the tree of current reality once again which now contains newly uploaded programs of resistance, like additional branches. We test the tree's effectiveness and usefulness. And so on, the injections are introduced into areas that are fragile. This is how weaknesses are revealed. This is done in order to develop a series of algorithms and instruments that either protect these weak spots if they require protection, or turn them into instruments of power, if possible. And so this is performed until the tree of current reality becomes generally indestructible. And so those first injections were introduced into the system by god Loki, of course. It is his job to introduce injections. The injections took the form of the three born children. Hell became the ruler of the realm of the dead. The Midgard serpent circled the world ocean and became akin to the Ouroboros serpent that is eating its own tail. And we will talk about the symbolism later as well. And the wolf was taken by the gods to Asgard. The wolf cub grew by leaps and bounds. The only one who was courageous enough to feed him, as the tale says, was Tyr. The wolf cub was perfectly intelligent. He wasn't some wild animal. It's just that his power was titan-like, like that of the titans who fought the Olympians. The titans were feared so greatly that the Olympians hid them in the depths of Tartarus while shaking in fear. Here's a more or less similar situation. Granted, they weren't shaking, but were afraid nonetheless. Because at the time, there were no countermeasures available for this kind of force. 
So they began thinking how to restrain this force. They basically already tamed him. The wolf cub loves the gods. He lives in their home. But he's not a little wolf anymore. He is already half a world of a wolf. But the gods are afraid because they don't know, because they don't understand. Tyr isn't afraid, but the rest are. Tyr, as the high ruler, can't not take into consideration the opinion of the rest of the family. He must look at their fear carefully. He cannot laugh at it, at this fear, because it's a family problem. A family problem means a problem for the head of the family, who was Tyr at the time. The gods began to think how to bind the wolf. They smith the sturdiest of chains. The wolf tears them apart with no effort. They make it look like a game. Let's play a game, wolf. We will bind you and you will break the chains. Let's, says the wolf cub. He trusts them. There was no other way to combat your fear but by destroying what you're fearful of. Tyr knew a way. Others did not. Tyr perhaps would have been able to combat the fear, but not the others. Tyr had a choice between his family, his team, and the wolf. Tyr took the side of his team. And one must take responsibility for their decisions. Even if the family is in the wrong, you have to stick with them. This is what Tyr's choice tells us. Odin said differently. When the gods created the chains for the third time, they created them out of non-existent things. Out of illusions. And the legend tells us that the chains included six non-existent substances. The beard of a woman, spittle of a bird, roots of mountains, footsteps of a cat. Yes, what else was there? Six non-existent things, six illusory channels were used to create the chains that are in there. Remember, it's like a tale about the emperor's new clothes. But it was exactly that which does not exist that bound the wolf. However, as we said before, the wolf is not at all silly. He is intelligent with his titan-like mind. He's attached to Tyr and doesn't trust others. He's attached to and trusts the ones he loves. And those he doesn't love or isn't attached to, he doesn't trust, which is logical. When he saw these chains, he realized that he encountered something he didn't know. The wolf has no idea what an illusion is. He lives in the real world. He doesn't live in the world of lies, so he didn't understand, didn't discern. The gods tell him again, let's play, we will tie you up, and you do like last time, you did so well last time. Fenrir says, you will trick me. No, we will not, replied gods, lie number one. I know that you will trick me, we will not, lie number two. Fine, says Finrir. Give me a deposit. What kind of deposit do you wish for? Let the one who is not afraid and who believes I'm not being tricked put their arm into my mouth. If I'm not able to break these chains, I will keep the arm for myself. No one went for it but Tyr. He did it for his family. 
And it is clear, as the legend says, that the wolf could not break the chains and Tyr lost his arm. Also, the legend says the following. When the wolf bit off Tyr's arm, the gods were having fun. They were playing around, laughing. The only one not having fun was Tyr. He was really not in the mood to laugh. The gods were laughing. It is the lie number three. They betrayed the one who protected them. And this revealed an even greater vulnerability than the inability to face the fear for Fenrir. The wolf was bound, he was taken to a hidden island in Niflheimer. And he remained, or will remain there, until the Battle of Ragnarok, to face the program and fight the system once again. He'll be battling Odin, but we'll talk about this in due time, when it comes. According to the laws and regulations of the world we're currently discussing, According to the rules that Tyr developed, the one who loses any part of their body would be considered imperfect, on the one hand. On the other hand, someone who failed, in a global sense, cannot be considered impeccable either. So Tyr could not supervise this project any longer, because he was no longer impeccable. From the standpoint of perfection, Tyr is no longer perfect. Tyr leaves this position and passes his function on to Odin. But in order for Odin to integrate into the system, he needed to know the system. He needed to introduce himself, write himself into this entire system. And so the allegorical story about Odin sacrificing himself to himself describes how he obtained the code to the operating system. But sacrificing himself on the branches of the Yggdrasil tree he hung in the wind for nine long nights. No one fed him, no one gave him water. He was completely disconnected from any other system. He was autonomously uploading all algorithms of the created tree into himself. This way, Tyr was passing on the operational reins to Odin. He was uploading to him all developed programs, so that Odin would become an all-encompassing force. Weeping, Odin fell from the tree and weepingly picked up the runes the codes of operation, and several types of codes he passed to different races present in the tree. Legends say that the elves have their own, Aesir have their own, humans have their own. Every one of these codes gives various degrees of access to the operating system of the Yggdrasil tree. During the first course, you learn the codes that Odin gave to humans. Runes are the codes to operate the reality of the tree. And if you upload them to yourself like Odin did it, those codes will become accessible to you to a greater degree. They won't be just a single-use instrument. They will truly become initial codes, with a certain level of access, of course. Colleagues, don't pretend that all the mysteries of the world and possibilities of magic will become available to you. It will take work. Nonetheless, nonetheless, these are the keys to recognition, to the entrance. Keys like a pass to the informational entities that are present here, 
within the system of the nine worlds.